Good morning. Welcome to our time of worship this morning as we come into the presence of Almighty God and as we come before the one who knit us together, who created us, who gave us life and gave us breath, and who sustains us by his loving and faithful hand. Uh, not sure what your week has been like. I don't know what you've gone through, what you've experienced, but I know that the Lord is here to meet with us. The Lord is here to minister to us and to fellowship here with us as we join together in his presence. I want to thank you for coming out. It's a cool day, snowy day. Can't believe last week we sat on our deck with t-shirts on, and here we are this week a little chillier. So thank you for joining with us. Uh, If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Psalm 145. Psalm 145, we're going to begin at verse 8. Just listen to these words uh, from the psalmist, how powerful these words are and uh, how we can live in the hope and in the assurance of these words. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his wonder and his Tender mercies are over all his works. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. For he will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He also will hear their cry and save them. For the Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. Amen. Well, with all that's been going on in our world and (laughs) the crazy things that are happening, and in light of this coming week with Remembrance Day, I think it would be appropriate to just take a little bit of time for prayer. I want to pray for us as a church family, but I also want to pray for our community, for our nation, for the nations around us. And I want to thank the Lord for those who uh, have have given so much for our freedom, the freedom that we have to meet here uh, this morning, uh, meet and worship and be without fear. And that is a beautiful thing. We don't ever want to lose that that right, and so we want to pray that God will continue to bless us with these freedoms that we have. Some of these freedoms I think we take somewhat for granted, and uh, we need to remember that there were many young men and women who fought bravely and gave their lives in order that we would have the the gift uh, of freedom that we have today. And so uh, I also want to pray over the offering and invite uh, Mel to come with the offering plates. Just want to... uh, Just pray God's blessing over over the gifts that we receive, over the offerings, over your participation. Um, This is the one thing that God has said, test me on in our giving. And uh, we believe that when we give, God will give back in an abundance. It's not that we give to get, but we do give because we serve a great God. And so uh, we're just going to take a little bit of time in prayer and then... I just want to invite you to stand. After I'm done praying, we're going to remain standing for a moment of silence. So please join with me as we come before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we pause this morning to remember the words of the psalmist, the words that you have given to us as you uh, reveal yourself to us, that you are a gracious God, slow to anger, that you are filled with compassion and mercy. Lord, we believe that to be true. And as we look out at our world and as we look at the struggles and the challenges and the chaos and the violence, Lord, we pray your mercy over our world. 
First, we pray it over our hearts for the struggle and challenges that are within our own hearts, the sin that we have. We pray, Lord, that we would come before you in a place of repentance, that we would come eager to be uh, in right fellowship with you, to let go of the things that uh, tangle us and snare us, that cause us to trip up. We would let go of those and we would come in a place of humility, seeking your forgiveness, grace, and mercy over our lives, that we might live in the fullness of the eternal life you've given to us. But we also pray, Lord, for our nation and for the nations around us. Lord, we see the brokenness. We see what sin and evil can do. And we pray that by your hand of mercy and compassion, as we come, your people, in prayer, that, Lord, we could see a change because you are sovereign, you are in control. You have not left us here on our own. You have not abandoned us, but you are in control. And you are working within us to do something amazing, something incredible. And so we give you praise for that. But we pray for mercy over leaders, over governments, over the laws that seem to be for some and not for others. Lord, we just pray for righteousness and truth. Lord, we know that you are the, the righteous ruler, and one day we will live under your righteous rule, but for now we live in a place of brokenness, and we just pray, Lord, that we could be beacons of light and truth uh, that would restore some of what has been lost, restore some of what is being torn down, taken away. We do pray, Lord, that you would revive us again. The church is silent in a time when the church needs to be uh, a voice a real strong voice of hope and truth. The world needs it so badly. And Lord, it begins here with us, with each individual believer, understanding what you have done for us, what you are doing for us, and what you are going to do, and then living that out for the world to see. Lord, we do have, by your strength, by your grace, the power to change lives around us. And so we pray that as we speak in hope and in truth, Others will receive the good news, and by your Holy Spirit, they will be brought to salvation. And so, Lord, as the world gets darker, may we as your children become greater lights, brighter lights, shining uh, for your kingdom and for your glory. Lord, we thank you for those who, it seems many years ago, but it wasn't really that long ago, left our country to go to another land to fight on our behalf. We will not forget, Lord. We will remember those who have given their lives on our behalf. Help us not to take our freedoms for granted, but to cherish them and to know that it is by your grace that we have them, but by the sacrifice of many lives they were upheld. And so, Lord, may your mercy be over those brave men and women who gave their lives for our sake. And we pray, Lord, that we would be um, we would be thankful to those who give their, stand in harm's way today on our behalf. If we see a veteran, we would thank them for their service. When we see a police officer, we would thank them, a first responder, Lord. They face so many difficult and challenging things. May you guard and protect them, we pray. May you guard and protect the liberties and freedoms that we hold dear. May you continue to reign over this country. May we see a great change in the lives of the people of this land. We desperately need it, Lord. We need to be revived again for your kingdom and for your glory. We thank you for the gifts you've given to us and the opportunity you give us to sow into your kingdom. May we do so generously, knowing that this kingdom is everlasting. And what we sow into this kingdom will be eternal. And so give us hearts of great joy. Give us, Lord, confidence in what we give to you that it will be used for your kingdom and for your glory. And so we pray your blessing over the offering. We pray all of this in the powerful name of Jesus, the name that is above every name. Amen.
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Habakkuk said, Lord, please tell me what you're doing. And God said, no, I'm not going to tell you, Habakkuk, because if I told you what I was doing, you wouldn't believe it. If God today told us what he's doing in the world, we wouldn't believe it. Don't 
you think God's given up and God's abdicated and God's left the throne? He hasn't. He's still on the throne. And those of us that know him put our trust in him and him alone. I don't put my trust in Washington. I don't put my trust in the United Nations. I don't put my trust in myself. I don't put trust in my money. I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. When all the rest of it fails and crumbles and shatters, he'll be there. We've talked a lot over the past couple of months about the gift of God, which is eternal life. And the more I kept digging into it, the more amazed I became. Uh, I, it's so exhaustive, you just, cannot, uh, you just cannot dig deep enough. It's like an onion. You take the first layer, it just keeps unraveling, opening up, and it's incredible. The power of what we are learning, the power of this gift of God which is eternal life. And we talked about how this gift is not something that we are one day going to receive, one day when we all get to heaven, but rather it's a gift that we have already been given. We received it the very moment we were born again. At that very moment, we were given a brand new life. At that very moment, the Spirit of the living God began dwelling within us, which is eternal life. Therefore, we've already received the gift of God. So we think of it this way. The very moment we were born physically, when our moms gave birth to us, at that very moment, God gave to each one of us a gift. He gave us the gift of breath. And we began to breathe. The very moment we were born again, born of the Spirit, God gave to us another gift. He gave to us the gift of of eternal life, the gift of His Spirit within us. But here's the big difference. The moment we were born physically and took that first breath was the moment that we actually began dying. But the moment we took that first breath of eternal life, that's the moment we actually began living. And when we took that breath, when we received the gift of God, that eternal life, God began doing something incredible within us, within each one of us. Paul says in Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing. I love how he says that. Being confident. It's a powerful word. Being certain, being able to stand solid on this no matter what might come. Being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in us will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. I think this teaching, this teaching on eternal life, I think it's absolutely critical to us in our walk as believers. I think we really need to take hold of this truth and learn to live in it. If I was to ask each of you if you had eternal life, you'd probably say yes. We have the head knowledge. We have the head knowledge. We'll say that we do. But are we living into it? Are we fully embracing the truth of the fact that the living God lives within me? I'm unstoppable. God lives within me. If you're born again, you're not waiting for it. You're already walking in it. The Apostle John said in John chapter 5, verse 11, he said, this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. We're not waiting for it. God has given it to us. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has eternal life. I'm going to say it again. He who has the Son has eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son, he who does not have the Son of God, does not have eternal life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you might know. There's going to come a time of testing. There's going to come a time of doubting. You're going to wonder, am I really saved? Is this real? That you might know that you have eternal life and that you may continue, persevere, keep walking, keep moving in the name of the Son of God. So number one, we have eternal life. We have eternal life. Number two, the Holy Spirit of God dwells within you. 
The living God has taken up residency within you. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, he's speaking to a church that is in trouble. The church has got problems. There's a lot of crazy things going on in that church. And he says, do you not know? Why is he telling them this? Because he says there should be a change within you. Do you not know that you are the temple of the living God and that the Spirit of God dwells within you? And then again, in chapter 6, verse 19, just in case we might have missed how incredibly significant this is, Paul says again, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? It's the gift of God to you. Now, most important, listen to this, and you are not your own. When you were born again, something happened. Many things happened. One of those things was you gave up ownership. There was a transfer of ownership. It's no longer yours. It's now God. God now is in control. You were bought at a very high price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, most people, most commentators, when they look at that ending of that verse, they would say, well, that's because they were such a sinful bunch. They were doing all kinds of crazy things in that church. And that's why he says glorify God. No, you know what Paul's speaking of? Glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Why? Because you have eternal life within you. Now allow it to be expressed. Begin to live in it. Begin to walk in it. It's not just head knowledge. It's heart knowledge. It's life knowledge. It's who I am. It's how I live. So we have eternal life. We know that the spirit of God dwells within us. And number three, he who began a good work might possibly know will will bring it to completion. There's no question about it. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing. So a second thing that happened when you, be, when you were born again, when you gave your life to Christ, the second thing that happened is God said to, you, to each of us, he said, okay, now life has changed for you. Everything's changed. Now you will begin to walk by faith rather than sight. All your life before, you walked by sight. You walked by what was going on around you, what you thought, what you perceived. Not anymore. Now you will walk by faith. I've given you the roadmap. It's right here. Here's how you will walk. You will go forward trusting this, believing this, and following this. This is your roadmap. You will now walk by faith, not by sight. But I'll tell you, it's not easy to do, is it? Like, let's be honest, it's not an easy thing to do. And I'm not trying to be a sensationalist. I'm not trying to sell a book. But I can tell you, I think it's going to get a whole lot tougher to walk by faith. That's why I said last week, my deepest desire and prayer is that you and I be prepared spiritually. That we be prepared spiritually, that we put on the full armor of God because we need it. That our faith be strengthened in order that we, not might, but that we do continue walking in faith, even when things around us appear impossible, being confident of this very thing. This very thing is where our confidence is found. What do you place your confidence in in this life? Think about that for a moment. I mean, we naturally will go, oh, my confidence is in God. Yes. Where else is your confidence found? Because we put our confidence in a lot of things that we don't even think about. We just put the confidence there. We have confidence that we'll come to church next Sunday. We always did. We were confident of that. Not anymore. We don't have that confidence anymore. There's a lot of places we put our confidence in. It might be in my own ability. It might be in my own giftings, my education, my opportunity to just go out and get it done. I can do it. I can just go and get it done. I put a lot of confidence in that. You might put a lot of confidence in your savings, what you've stored up, what you've saved. You might put your confidence in other, other people, your friends, family, things like that. You might put your confidence in the government, in leadership, in your rights, the Magna Carta. You might put your confidence in the law, that the law will always be there and the law will always protect you. You might put your confidence in the fact that everything will just work itself out. I've heard that from far too many people where they say, don't worry, it's all going to just work itself out. It'll all work out in the end. 
But when we think about it, we do place our confidence in a lot of different places, in a lot of different things. But I believe, this is what I think the pressure and the stress of this whole time has been on us. I don't think it's so much the fear of a virus that we are feeling so much pressure and stress right now. I don't think that's it. I think why we're feeling so much pressure and so much stress is that this year, 2020, has been the undoing, has been the unraveling of a lot of our preconceived, maybe not identified in our own lives, but things that we considered to be something that we were confident in. Confidences that we simply took for granted. We just assumed they would always be there. And we were confident in that. But now here we are, approaching 2021, and it appears that everything is up for grabs. And our confidence has been deeply shaken. That's where our stress is. Our confidence has been deeply shaken. We really don't know what we can believe, and we really don't know who we can trust. But friends, here's the beautiful part. Here's how we live into this, where it becomes no longer head knowledge, but it's heart knowledge. This is how we live into this. As believers in the risen, reigning Lord, we walk by faith and not by sight. God calls us, in Ephesians, he says that we are children of the light. We've moved from darkness into light, so we now see where others can't. This is so important to us as we continue going forward. We see where others can't. It's, we're like the Israelites. The Israelites in the land of Goshen. Do you remember that story? Do you remember how, how Joseph uh, was in Egypt and his brothers came to him and, and, the, and Pharaoh said, bring your brothers down. They can all come and live. There were 70 in number. And he said, bring them to the land of Goshen. I'll give you the land of Goshen. You can live there. And the Israelites began to grow and grow in number. And then God says, okay, 400 years later, it's time to bring my people out. And so God sends these plagues on Pharaoh and on the pe- people of Egypt. And one of those plagues was a plague of deep darkness. Terrible darkness, unbelievable darkness. So all, in, all over Egypt, Goshen was a part of Egypt, but all over Egypt, it's complete and utter darkness, yet in the land of Goshen, it's light. Isn't God amazing what he can do? In the land of Goshen, there's light, but all around them, there's deep darkness. Exodus 23, 10, 23 says, No one could see anyone else. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. They couldn't move about for three days, three days in hell. Yet all the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. We live in the light. And just like the Israelites, we are the people of promise. We are the people of tomorrow, the eternal tomorrow. And we have confidence in this very thing, not what we see around us, but in the eternal life that God has given to us, in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit who is within us, and in the knowledge that God will not maybe, not might, but will bring his work, this work that he has started, he will bring it to completion. Friends, God didn't bring the Israelites halfway out of Egypt and then say, no, can't do it. He didn't bring them halfway across the Red Sea. He didn't bring them halfway across the wilderness. He finished what he had begun. He brought them all the way into the promised land. That's the confidence we walk in. What do we see all around us right now? We see darkness. We see darkness. We see confusion, terrible confusion. We see chaos. We see violence. We see the darkness. But where are we? We're living in the light. We stand confidently in the light of God's word, in the light of God's promises. How many of you, when you were young, had the traumatic experience of enduring the movie called The Sound of Music. (laughs) My mom loved that movie. I I think it might have been a Christmas classic, but we had to watch it every year. But if you remember, Julie Andrews, I try not to, but if you do remember, Julie Andrews sings these words. She sings, I have confidence in sunshine. I have confidence in rain. I have confidence that spring will come again. Besides which you see, I have confidence in me. Now, some would say it was a catchy tune. I'm not so sure. And the words seem harmless enough in and of themselves. But I think they really speak to who we are 
in our nature, who we are at our core. Because we struggle a lot to give control over to someone else. We want that control for ourselves. And we say, I'm confident in my ability to get myself out of this or to get myself through this. Oh, I believe in God, and I believe that God's doing something, but I'm still captain of this ship. That's our natural desire. But remember, when we were born again, we gave that up. We transferred that ownership. And Proverbs says in 3, 5, and 6, it says, trust in the Lord. It changes everything. It says, now you trust in the Lord with all your heart. You lean not on your own confidence. You lean not on your own understanding. But in all things, you acknowledge him. Meaning, in all things, everything, we trust God. If I'm trusting the Lord with all my heart, which Proverbs calls me to do, then it leaves no room for me. I'm out of the equation. I'm trusting him with all of my heart. I'm not trusting myself. My confidence is fully in the Lord. The Israelites found themselves in a place completely out of their control. Their confidence was gone. They had none. They were slaves. They were defeated. They were under the control of another. And then suddenly, God steps in. God steps in and he says, okay, I'm going to take you from here to here. I'm going to take you from here in slavery to the promised land. But now you must have faith in me. You must walk by faith rather than sight. If you want to get to the promised land, I'm going to give you the directions to go. And I'm going to lead the way, but you must walk by faith. You must trust me. God says the same thing to you and to me. When we become born again, he says, okay, we're starting here, and I'm going to take you to here, but you've got to walk with me. You've got to follow me. Your faith has to be in me in order to get there. We walk by faith, not by sight. You must trust that I will lead you. This is God speaking. He says that you must trust that I will lead you to the promised land. Even when everything around says it's crazy. Pharaoh, Egypt was one of the strongest nations in the world. Pharaoh ruled. Seriously, God? You're going to lead us out of here? And what happened when they got to the Red Sea? Now what? Well, you got us started. Now what? We have to walk by faith. And if we look at Israel... We know that when they placed their confidence in God, when they said, okay, I'm going, we're going to go with you, Lord. We're going to follow you. When they put their confidence in God, everything changed. Everything changed. It transformed everything. Friends, there begins a completely new way of seeing, a completely new way of thinking, and a completely new way of living. We are confident, confident, certain, sure of this work that God is doing. What is this work that God has begun in us? What is that work? It's the eternal life that he's placed within us. It's the salvation that he's given to us. It's this journey from darkness, from Egypt into the land of Goshen, into the land of light. And then he takes us from captivity into the promised land. Israel is the picture, it's the type of what God is doing within each one of us. And Paul says in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, he says, everything that was written in the past was written for a purpose. It was written for a reason. It's not just words in a book. It was written to teach us so that through the endurance that we witness, through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement, we might have hope and persevere. You see, God began a work in Israel, a good work in Israel, and he will one day yet bring it to completion. God's not done with Israel yet. He will finish what he started. And God has begun a good work in you and me, and he will bring it to completion. In the Greek the words has begun. It speaks to a uh, very decisive or, or a very deliberate act that God did. When you were born again, it's not of your doing, it's by the Holy Spirit. It was a very purposeful and deliberate act that God invoked in your life. 
It wasn't random chance. It wasn't just luck that you were born into a Christian family or that you came to meet somebody who led you to the Lord. It wasn't chance. It wasn't luck. It was God's direct, deliberate act that brought you into faith. Why? Because he's got a purpose, and he's going to do something amazing in your life. He's going to work in you. He's going to bring this whole eternal life, this salvation, to its completion on the day of Christ Jesus. You know, I'm the king probably of half-finished jobs. I start for lots of projects, and I get them about halfway, and then move on to the next one, and my wife's always, are you going to finish that? Yeah, one day I'll get to it. We do. We do that. We, we start a lot of hobbies. We do a lot of different activities. We might even start businesses. We start them up, and we put a lot of thought and a lot of time and a lot of energy into them, but in the end, what do we say? We say, well, I sure hope this works out. I really hope this business goes because I put a lot of money into it. I put a lot of time into it. And unfortunately, I think a lot of us view our salvation in the same way. Well, I sure hope this works out in the end. I sure hope I get there. You know what? That's not living with eternal life. That's not living with the Holy Spirit within me. That's not living and believing that God is working something something very good and that he will complete it. That's not living in confidence. That's just walking basically in apathy, saying, well, if I make it, I make it. We are confident in this very thing. And it changes everything. It changes how we view everything. We need to be constantly reminding ourselves, if you want, honestly, if you want a verse to memorize, memorize this verse from Isaiah 46.10. Because Isaiah is encouraging a group of people who are going through something very similar to what we're going through right now. They don't know what's up and what's down. Everything's being pulled out from under them. And he says, remember the former things of old. He says, think back. For I am God, and there is no other. No other. I am God, and there's none like me declaring the end from the beginning. Declaring what it's going to be at the end, he declares it right at the very beginning. From ancient times, things that are not yet done, things that are still to happen, he's already declared them saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. I will do what I need to do. Whatever's happening in the world is not changing God's plan. God is doing what he declared he would do. This is the confidence that we have, that the same God that called out Abraham, who called out Israel, who called out David, who called out John the Baptist to prepare the way of the Lord, is the same God who has called out you and called out me. He has declared you. He's declared me from the beginning. From the very beginning. In the book of Job, it says, Man's days are determined. You, God, have decreed the number of his days and have set limits he cannot exceed. God's in complete control. He's begun this great work of eternal life within us and he will complete it. We have to hold on to that. Friends, God doesn't say, Well... I'm going to give it a whirl with you. Hopefully it works out. We'll see. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say that with creation. He didn't say that when he created. He said, it's good. It's very good. He doesn't say that with salvation. He says, no, I'm going to work this. I'm going to finish this. I'm going to finish what I started in you. And he certainly doesn't say that with eternity. Not a chance. God has already declared the end. The victory is already complete. Our call is to walk this path, this line, this this journey by faith and just say, okay, Lord, I trust you. I trust that you have called me out. You've set me apart, and I'm going to follow your word to the end, to the end, because I trust it. And believing whatever comes into my life, be it wonderful and glorious, 
or be it painful and discouraging, I'm going to walk with confidence, knowing that what God has begun, he will bring to completion. He will complete it. I'm just about finished, but this is so important. We walk in confidence. When we begin walking in confidence, when this is how we begin to live and act, if this is the way we begin to look out at the world around us, the way we look at our friends and our neighbors, confident in the eternal life we have, confident that the Spirit of God is within me, confident that he who has begun a good work will complete it, it changes everything because, as Paul said, we give up our life. It's not ours anymore. That's what Paul said. You've been bought at a price. So it's not about me anymore. It's not about my education. It's not about my giftings. It's not about my strength or my power. God might use them for his kingdom, for his glory. Maybe if he chooses to, that's fine. But it's not about me anymore. It's about the eternal life that is now within me. It's about what God has begun, what God's going to bring to completion. Paul goes through this long list of all the reasons that he should or could be confident in himself. He talks about his heritage. He talks about his upbringing. He talks about his education. He talks about his zeal, how on fire he is. But what does he say? He says it's all rubbish. Means nothing. I don't put my confidence there anymore. What matters is what God is doing. What matters is that my life, that my body is now the throne, is now the temple, the vessel of the living God. And that means a lot of things. It means it can never be destroyed. It means it can never be defeated. It means it can never be lost. But it also means I no longer live, but now Christ lives within me. And thank God, when you start getting the thought of that in your mind, you realize it's not about me. It's not about me at all. It's Christ living within me. I have eternal life. That means I don't have to fear anything anymore. The living God is within me. So I put my confidence in him. And when I do, do you remember that seed? We talked about that seed when you're born again. God plants a seed within us. That mysterious seed that was planted now begins to grow. I'm giving it room to grow. The more confidence I have in what God has begun within me, the more I believe that he's going to bring it, not possibly, he's going to bring it to completion, the more that seed grows. And soon my life begins producing fruit. It's not because of me. It's not because of anything I've done. It's because the Spirit of God is within me. The more confident I am in the truth that I have eternal life, the more room I give for the Spirit of God to live and express himself within me and fulfill this good work that he will bring to completion. The more confident I am, the more fruit I produce. And typically, we don't see that fruit. We always say to ourselves, well, I am not producing any fruit. It's others who see the fruit being produced. Others will see it. We might not. So, we begin to walk in confidence. We begin to walk in confidence just saying, Lord, I have eternal life. You dwell within me. And you're completing a good work. You're going to bring it to completion. I will see it fulfilled. And when we do, we produce all God is able to do amazing things through us, more than we could ever imagine, more than we could ever speak or think. According, Paul says in Ephesians, according to the power that is at work within us. So we praise God this morning. We praise him. This is powerful stuff. This is huge stuff. Let's praise him for all that he has done as we look back. All that he is doing today as he's changing us and transforming us in all that he is going to do, as he brings us, as we follow the roadmap into the promised land. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you. We stand in awe. We are humbled that you would pick one such as me. You would choose to make a deliberate, decisive act and bring me into salvation. Offer to me the gift of God, which is eternal life. Lord, thank you for the promises of your word. I pray that we would have confidence to stand squarely on these promises. 
We see, as that song said, culture shifting all around us. There's nothing in this world around us that we can hold fast to, nothing that is solid. There's no anchor out there. Everything is shifting. But we have the anchor in you. And that anchor says, we have eternal life. You dwell within us, and you will complete the good work onto the day of Christ Jesus. Lord, may that be the anchor that holds us fast. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.